when I prepare for these sermons, um, it's when I come to you on a Sunday morning and I have like 30 some minutes or so, uh, or more, which is typically more, okay, <laughs> it's more than 30 minutes, um, I, I bring before you many hours of work, um, study at my desk in my office, study at a coffee shop, I open up my Bible, I open up commentaries, I'm looking up doing word studies, I'm, I'm doing searches, I'm listening to other people's sermons, I'm just doing all this to and, and I spend, you know, weeks preparing for this, you know, like l- next week's sermon I wrote a few weeks back, right? And so I just, I spent a lot of time on this, and, and I love that time of getting to interact with God and hear from Him, and I really believe that it's, it's a really cool time where I get to interact with God's Spirit in a, in a unique way, and, and I just really love that, and, and doing the study is a lot of fun, and praying over you guys, and praying, o- I just really, you know, so when I come on Sunday mornings, typically that means there's a a lot of work that goes up behind it, but today's a little bit different because I'm throwing away all that work, okay? I'm just tossing it all away because one of the things that I've learned in the 13, 14 years that I've been preaching, that I've been coming and speaking God's word, is that there's this place, there's like this pressure point in my heart and in my head that I've just learned to recognize as the spirit nudge the spirit whisper the spirit push and typically when i get something stuck in my head like i just get stuck i i i uh i I know that eventually it's going to come out in a sermon right i just typically i know i can kind of log this away like okay god wants to speak this um to the church right so there's kind of like this there's a part of my heart that's like god does his work on me and there's a part of my heart for the church part of my heart for the family and all this stuff you know and um, so I've just learned to listen. You know, that's so much of the Holy Spirit is just learning how to be open and, and willing to his presence, to his call, to his nudgings, to those moments, right? And, uh, well, this morning, as um, we're driving here, my daughter and I are having a conversation. I'll talk about it in a little bit. And something gets stuck in that place, right? And as I'm pulling up to the church um, uh, um, it's still stuck there. And, and, and as I'm walking up to the door, it's still stuck. And as I'm starting to interact with people, it's still stuck. When I go to my office uh, to change, it's stuck. When I come out and I start talking to people, it's still stuck there. And again, I've just kind of learned to trust that thing that God has done um, when he speaks to that part of me. And so I was just like, okay, God, like, you just want me to toss out what I've, you know, I spent like a couple hours last night pr- praying and, and practicing. Do you just want me to throw that away and just kind of get up and go? And, and, and the answer was yes. And so, um, so I'm stepping out of my comfort zone a little bit. Now, I did get to kind of talk this through during the last service, but that doesn't mean this is going to be smooth, okay? <laughs> like, but again, I've just learned to just trust this place with God. And uh, I don't think it's a mistake that, you know, last week we talked about the Holy Spirit and next week we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And so uh, we're just going to trust him today. Okay, is that cool? All right. Like I'm more nervous about this one than I was the last one for some reason. So we're just going to let go and let God just. Okay, so we're going to pray. Let's pray. Well, gracious Father, we we love you. You are worthy of all the honor and all the glory and all the praise. You've blessed us so abundantly beyond anything that we deserve. Through your son Jesus, you you took the you took the punishment of our sin upon yourself in, in a way that again that we didn't deserve. And we got nothing but left but to just say thank you. And and you are worth all of our lives, God. You're worth every part devoted and focused on you, Jesus. The world has a way of trying to distract us and to try to pull us away and to try to get us to focus on stuff that is that is stuck in time and, 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 and will end. But God, you, the eternal God, you're worthy of all of our devotion. And I just ask that, um, that I'd get out of the way that your spirit would speak, God, that, that you would open the hearts and the minds of all of us in this room to receive from you. 
and that we would refocus on just the stuff that really matters, on, on the stuff that, that you care about. I pray our hearts would love what you love, that they would break for what your hearts break for, that, that even, Jesus, you got mad, that we would recognize a holy unrest, upset. So, Lord Jesus, we just ask that we'd be more like you every day. We thank you again for the cross. We thank you again that, that we stand before you righteous because you covered our, the death in our lives with your blood. Thank you for that. Jesus, we, we ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. Anthony, could you help me? Could you grab that and bring it on up here for me? So when I, when I was born, that's a great start, right? When I was born... It was March 17th, okay, 1983. Thank you, Anthony. Let's give Anthony a hand. Woohoo! Nice bud. March 17th is my birthday, and it's kind of cool being born on holidays. It's really easy for people to remember uh, your birthday. You often get a lot of green things because it's readily available, okay? And uh, I am not Irish. Well, actually, wait, actually, my dad actually did a bloodline test. I, we didn't used to think that, but he did one of those things where you like do the swab and mail it in, and you get that stuff back. Yeah, that I have, that I have uh, some, some Irish and Scottish <laughs> background, so I, I can actually change that. I'm saying that now. So I guess I am a little bit Irish, but um, it, it's kind of cool to be born on this day. But what's really funny is that, like, we don't celebrate St. Pa- Patrick's Day the right way, okay? <laughs> like, I mean, it's fun to party and have fun, and, and I, you know, I, I, I don't have a problem with that as long as you're, you know, not being stupid, you know? Um, but, man... When I was 16, I'll never forget, 16 or 17, I'll never forget my dad taking me out. We went to um, a new local uh, Mexican restaurant that had just opened up and had some just amazing, authentic uh, Mexican food. And we can say that it was authentic because every year we would go down to Mexico and build houses, and they would always make us a meal, authentic Mexican. So I know what authentic Mexican food is like, and it's not like typically what we have. But we got to enjoy that together. And he said, son, do you know about St. Patrick's Day, the guy whose day you were born on? And I said, no, not really. And so he told me the story that starts off of a of a boy, a boy who grew up in England, um, who grew up kind of on the coast. But one day, a, a raiding party from people from Ireland came over and stole him away from his home and took him back to uh, their family, to their clan and they made him kind of like a son slave. You know, they, they, they didn't treat him like a terrible slave, but he was also not really free to go. But they also kind of made him a part of the family. And so he grew up in Ireland in a place where, you know, that w- it was not his heritage, didn't belong there. Um, and, and one day when he was still young, he said that uh, God had given him a vision. Now, he had been introduced to God and the church back in England. But there really wasn't any of that going on in Ireland. A lot of false gods, a lot of nature goddess stuff happening over there. And and he got this vision from God. And um, it was of this certain city in Ireland and of a certain boat. And so as as the story goes, he left, he ran away, went to that city and was able to stow away back on the boat and actually get home. Now, when he got home, he was, again, reintroduced back into the church, and he fell in love with God, and, and he gave himself over to the priesthood, and, and he was trained uh, by the church. And while he was studying and while he was um, learning and, and, and leading, uh, God put a call on his heart to go back to Ireland, to go back to these people that had stolen him away. But it still made him kind of a part of their family. And he knew that God really wasn't there. And so he asked if he could go. And uh, he was supported to go um, over to Ireland and and start planting a church. But you see, what's really interesting about St. Patrick is he was incredibly wise. Um, He knew that if he tried to take what was what the, the way they were doing church back home and tried to plant it there that it just wouldn't work the culture the people the way they lived life was just so different that they would not be interested in this liturgical kind of 
way of doing things. And so what he did was he, what he, what he did was he did, he planted a church, but instead of just planting a church, he built a community around the church. When people would come in, they would teach them life skills like how to farm and how to sew and how to read, how to write, all these things. And they, what he did, he didn't just like plant a church where they would come together on Sunday mornings to worship and Wednesdays to worship and whatever. He really built this really beautiful community. And if you came into their community, there would be someone assigned to you that would walk you through, help you get to know the people and stay with you and help disciple you as you drew in closer to Jesus. And everything they did over here, over there in Ireland was was focused on Christ. Everything. The smallest of tasks would have special prayers. Just to remind people that even in doing the smallest things that they could honor God, right? And and what happened was that it just blew up. Like it spread like wildfire across Ireland. And and you know, you might know stuff about uh uh you, know, you hear stuff about like driving off snakes and all that kind of stuff from St. Patrick. That's kind of more common knowledge. But St. Patrick had a had a uh, had a reputation for just doing practical things that were just good for the people, right? And and what was really amazing is as he's over here doing this 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 amazing movement of God is happening across Ireland. He looks back home and and it's dying. The church is dying over there. They're stuck. It's falling apart. They're still just doing things the way they used to do it. And what was really fascinating is that in his story, the people of Ireland started sending missionaries back to the church because they were missing something, right? You see, what, 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 what the people of Ireland taught St. Patrick about the church was that the church wasn't about the walls, it wasn't about the services. It wasn't about the preaching. It was about the people. It was about a community coming together and loving one another and supporting one another. And man, if you know God's word, this should just be ringing true to your heart. That God created us for relationship. He created us for community. He created us that we might know one another and that we might need one another the gifts of the Spirit that Paul talks about, that he gives out to different people. He didn't give us all the same gifts because he knew that if, if we all did the same thing, we wouldn't want one another. We wouldn't need one another. We could just be our own shining rock stars, right? But that we would need to lean upon one another, right? Just like the fingers need the thumb and the palm needs the fingers and the, and the arm needs the hand, Right? that we would need one another. And he recognized that it wasn't about the way you do church. It was about the people. It was about the community. Now, let me tell you how this is connected to the conversation I had with my daughter. This morning as we're driving in, what was really interesting is that um, we just somehow got on. She just, out of nowhere, she just said, I think I have a new one life. Now, if you're new to Hope Summit, we have this... Uh, this, this we, 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 we have this idea that all of us, if we, are, uh, if we are followers of Christ, if we say Jesus is my guy, right, that, that, that I'm a Christian, that, that we should all have this one life, that the, 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 the call of Jesus to his disciples in Matthew 28, to go into all the world and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, that that great commission was not just meant for the apostles, that it was meant for all believers, and that all of us, if we believe in Jesus, should have that one person or, or maybe even more people in your life that you know who are far from Christ and that we should be intentional in their lives, that we should be building up relationship with them so that they can have a chance of meeting Jesus in and through us. We talked about this a little bit last week. Last week we talked about how Jesus said in uh, John 16, uh, John 16, 5 through well, 5 through 15, but, but he says that if I, go, if I go, it's good, because unless I go away, the advocate will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. That's verse 7, right? And, and he says that he sent an advocate to us. And last week we talked about how the advocate 
that we need with God in between us and God is Jesus. He came to the earth. He died on the cross to take the punishment of your sin and my sin so that you and I could stand before God righteous. That our sin is an affront to his holiness and he's not going to put up with it. But in belief and repentance and baptism, we get that just completely washed away. And now we can stand before God and you and I can have a personal relationship with him. And since I kicked off this week's message, we'll push it off to next week. And we'll talk more about that next week, okay? But that we have this awesome opportunity to just come straight to God. And so we have this great relationship, this, this, this awesome relationship with him as the advocate. But... When the Holy Spirit is called the advocate here, it's not because we need a second advocate to God. You see, the Holy Spirit is an advocate between God and the rest of the world. That, that, that the, the, the Holy Spirit came to, 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 to be this bridge to help people see God. Now, what's fascinating is that the Holy Spirit has a special place that it lives, and it's in His church. It's in every one of its believers. And so that means you and I are an advocate for God to the world to show the world that they're missing something, that they're wrong about righteousness and judgment and about sin. And that in that we have found this, this key to, to peace and, and to true life. And that you and I carry with us the, the answer to so many of life's difficult issues. That in Christ we are giving something so special and that we are not to hide it away and protect it and control it. That we are to let it shine out bright. And that our job, our job is to love those, anyone, whether they're already coming to church or not. We are to love all those so that all might have a chance of taking more and more steps towards Jesus. That's what we're about here, right? And so we challenge you guys to have one life. People who don't have a relationship with God, how are you taking time to love on them? And so we were talking about my daughter. She says, I think I have a new one life. And I was like, okay, yeah, who? So she told me about a friend of hers that she says, I know she doesn't go to church, but she hasn't really made a definitive statement about God. And I have another one life. Who doesn't, re who doesn't go to church, and she's also said she doesn't believe in God, right? And so we're just kind of talking about that, and she's saying, well, I just, you know, I just want to, I just want them to know how much they're loved and all this stuff, and, and it was really encouraging to see this, but at the same time, I saw this twinge of guilt in her heart that I, I don't want to see in her life. Like, I, it was this guilt that I can't get my friends to come to church with me, Okay? Has anyone else been there before? Has anyone else felt that guilt? You know, and, and this is what we do. What's really interesting, okay, is that so often this is, this is kind of how we handle this, right? So let's say this is the church, okay? This is the church. And we have one lives, right? We're more than likely outside of coming to church consistently, right? And we think it's so like it's so natural, just like my daughter, to think, okay, I have a one life. I I want to love them intentionally. I want to I want to help them know God more. And so so one of the things I need to do is get them to come to church, right? It's very normal, very natural. And so we're like, all right. So if I can move them from here to here, yes, I've done my job, right? I've done the work. I can hand it off to Jeff and the staff and the elders, and they'll take it from there, right? Now, even as I say those words, some of you are smiling because you're like, no, that's not what that's about. And you'd be right, right? The goal isn't to move people from here to there. That's not the goal. But what's weird is that we kind of believe that, right? Don't we? We kind of think that way. And as I'm talking to my daughter, I'm just like, sweetie, 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 sweetie. I could just see the guilt. I could just see the fear. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not the win. Okay? Well, okay, it's not the win. Is it a win? Well, of course it is. Right? For someone to actually, like, 
try out church, that's a big deal. So would that be a great step for them? Yes. But I saw in her what I see in so many and I see in myself. That far too often we make that the big win. And so what I want to do today is I want to de-emphasize this a little bit. Okay, I don't want to take it completely off the table, but I want to de-emphasize it. And, and I want to give it another name that might help us a little bit. Because here's the deal. Is what we're doing right now, church? No. No. I saw some of you guys start to shake your head yes. Can I just stop you right there? Is what we're doing right now church? No. Do you know why? Because you can't do church. You are church. We are church. This is Sunday morning. And it is one of the goals. But far too often we emphasize this as the goal when the goal is very clear in God's word. The goal is Jesus. That's the purpose. The purpose is to know Christ, to have a relationship with Christ, to be Christ-like. Okay, if, if, if there's any center, if there's anything that gravity is always pulling us towards, it is being Christ-like. Which means there's a center here that none of us are ever going to truly 100% reach. Right? But the goal is Jesus. Okay, so there's like a deeper center, the gravity that pulls us all in. Right? And that's being like Christ. But the goal is to get people to know Christ. So what I want to do is I want to de-emphasize this, really emphasize this, and help us to recognize one important truth. That for people inside going to Sunday mornings, those people inside a relationship with Jesus already, that the goal for all of us is to take one more step closer, one more step closer, one more step closer, one more step closer, one more step closer. You get the point? That's the goal. That's the purpose. So we need to kind of, I almost just want to erase this circle, but I don't because it's, Sunday morning is good. But we need to de-emphasize it as the thing that we automatically first think of. Because the first thing I would love for all of us to think is just steps closer. I had a friend named Johnny. Now, Johnny, uh, when I first met him, was an atheist, right? Well, it's hard to be really good friends with a preacher and remain an atheist. I'm just going to say, okay? Um, he eventually became agnostic, which, by the way, I think is actually not necessarily the best step forward. Because agnosticism is just kind of lazy spiritualism. It's just kind of like, well, I think there's something. I just don't know what it is. Okay, we'll figure it out, right? That's, that's, what I, that's always what I challenge people to do, okay? But, but there was this really significant point in Johnny's life that I'll, that I'll never forget. That, you know, I, when I moved here, I moved away from Omaha. Um, and I'd been, he was one of my one lives. And I'd been real intentional in his life. And he had become very dear to me, a very good friend. Right. And we had had some up and downs talking about God, talking about his love and all this. And he even started to come to church for a little bit, which was really cool. Um, and then. Uh, but there was one point in his life that that I recognized as an important step. He had kind of started to get involved and then he kind of fell back away because he was still having doubts, which is fine. Doubts are gr doubts are fine as long as you're exploring them. OK. And. And I, he had said something about when he goes to bed at night and he starts thinking about God, he becomes afraid. And I was just like, Johnny, man, no one should live without fear. Because, man, we have a chance, just completely freedom of that, freeing, being free to that. And, and later, we came back around to that subject and I said, are you still afraid? I mean, when you put your bed on, on your pillow at night, he said, you know what, Jeff, that's one of the things I can really thank you for. He said, I'm not afraid of God anymore. 
right? I, 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 if, if your God is the God that is the true God, you've taught me and you've shown me that he just loves me and that everything that he does is because he wants me to know him better. And guys, can you, like, had he really taken a step into Christ yet? He hadn't even started to come to church at that point. But man, can I tell you what a huge step forward that was for him? What a tremendous step it was for him to go from being afraid of God to recognizing, wait, this God does actually care about me. Now, did I get him all the way in? No. But I can celebrate the step. And what I've learned throughout the years is there have been people in my life where I've taken them from here to here to here to nice and close, right? And every kind of journey along the way, I've been able to be there. And what a joy and a blessing it's been. But let me tell you something. This is actually quite rare. To take people who are completely away from God, to bring them all the way in, into it because life changes life pulls people away you know you, you it's, it's okay but what i've learned is that something that paul actually talked about when he was talking about apollos and the church was kind of saying well i'm with paul well i'm with apollos he's like well, hang on i planted the seed apollo watered them and god is now making them grow see there's something you got to understand that if you take someone this far that god being eternal and knowing the lifespan of that person god if you, if you are somehow, for some reason, out of that person's life, God can pick up the ball when you left it and take people further in. And I've seen story after story of people who are like that. Well, there was this person in my life, and they helped me know faith. And there was this person in my life, and they helped me l- love God. And there was this person in my life, and they challenged me for this. And, we, and just if you think about your own story, how many people are in your life, are in your faith story that helped you go from one step to the next step to the next step to the next step. And this kid named Trey, he was, uh, he was in my youth ministry. Super talented, super smart, a lover of pleasure, a lover of girls and popularity. And, and man, he was good. He was smart. He went to college and his life kind of went kind of where I figured it was going to head. He went to drugs, he went to alcohol, he went to some gang-related behavior. He got injured while playing sports and college football, and his life kind of started to fall apart. But he met a man who really loved Jesus and helped take him a step closer. Now, for a long time, I felt a lot of guilt about Trey. Man, if only I, and I, I had these thoughts, even though I completely understand this concept, I still had these thoughts. Well, if only I'd made him a better churchgoer. Come on. Our God's bigger than Sunday mornings because he met, he found the church. And you know what? When he met this man, I had already helped him trust men of God. He came to my youth group fairly consistently. He trusted me. And so he learned if a man of Jesus comes to you, you can trust that person. And when he was at his worst, the man of Jesus came to him and he didn't have to work on that trust. He already trusted him. And that man was able to help take him a step closer and a step closer. And now he's a pastor. <laughs> he's, a, he's a youth pastor. He's really good. I'm almost jealous. I shouldn't be jealous, but he's so talented, guys. And he's in this rocking, awesome church. He's just doing so many great things. Like, so, like I get to just be proud that I helped him ac- ac- across a couple of these big barriers in his life. And then I got to hand the ball off to some good men who carried it further. And so when you think about your one life, right, this is the concept I want you to have. Do we want you to bring your one life to church? Heck yeah, we do. Yes. I'm sorry if some of you are bothered because I just said heck. I'm sorry. (laughs) Do we want you to bring your one life to church? Absolutely we do. Because here they can get fed. Here we're going to continue to introduce them to the grace of God. Here they're going to get to know other people who love Jesus. And here they're going to get to an experience of community that cares about one another. Right? So yeah, do we want them to come to church? But listen, when we challenge you guys to love your one life, just think steps. Is this one of the things you, yeah. But guys, this is the thing that really matters. It's the big three. Believe. 
repentance, and baptism. Okay? These three things, God is clear in his word. This is what it takes to find salvation. Right? You want to be if you want to find salvation, you got to believe, you got to repent, which means you're walking one way and you turn and walk a different way, and then you be baptized. And in baptism, you get the gift, of, you get the spirit. That's when the spirit comes into your life, as Peter talks about in Acts two, right? Now, so these are the big things. But you know what's interesting is that I've met people who believed long before they ever showed up on a Sunday morning. I've seen people come to Sunday mornings and then start to believe. I've seen people come in with belief, but then start to repent. I've seen people on a weekend believe, repent, and be baptized, and then start coming to church. If you're looking for a goal, you want to see belief in their life. You want to see them come to face-to-face -to -face with God and say, God, I'm walking this way, but I should be walking that way. And then, of course, baptism is just one place in someone's life where they can put a stake in the, gr in the ground, where they can say, I made this choice by faith. And in this place, God gave me a spirit, and now the spirit walks in me. The same spirit that I have, the same spirit that we all have, is now going to reside in you. We're going to continue to talk about that next week. Now, as we talk about our one lives, okay, again, Sunday morning is a great, a great thing to push forward. But really, you just want to see this. Now, let's make it personal to you. How are you, wherever you are, maybe you're coming to church, but you haven't quite given yourself over to maybe repentance. Maybe you haven't been baptized yet. Okay, maybe you have these three things in your life, you're in here, but you just want to get as close to Jesus as possible. Maybe you just recognize that, that yeah, I've ex I believe, I've repented, and I've been baptized, but there's just a dryness in my life. I just want to get closer to him, right? I want to take steps closer to him. Well, we want to encourage you in those steps. You know, our, our whole vision is around this. Living to love and glorify Jesus through, inten uh, through personal disciplines, intentional relationships, and expressing your faith and love. We want to help you get connected to God's word. We want to get you connected. Uh, Sunday mornings are a great place to know God's word. By the way, if you feel guilty for not coming to church on Sunday, stop. Okay? Perfect love drives out all fear. I'd rather you just be hungry. If you miss church, don't sit there and feel guilty. That's condemnation from the enemy. If you miss church and you... And you recognize something's missing. Recognize that's hungry. That's being hungry. If you don't come to church on Sundays, that's a missed opportunity to be fed. Okay? And if you don't know how to cook food on your own, it's kind of nice to go someplace and let them cook good, good food, food for you, right? That's what I do when I'm in my office on throughout the week. And uh, at the coffee shop, I'm just cooking up a good meal for you. Right? So come and eat. You know, we don't even charge a tithe. You can give if you want. That's just, that was supposed to be a joke. No one laughed at that one. Ugh. Anyways, so, so let's talk about you. one of the other ways. Okay, so we want to help you get connected in God's word. We want to help get you connected to the heart of Christ for service. But there's a third way. Mike, why don't you come up here? There's a third way that we want to encourage you guys that we want to talk about today. Now, if you've been coming for the last few weeks, we, you know, we've been talking about uh, this Befriend series that we're going to be doing soon. Uh, the Befriend series uh, is going to start on September 30th, and we're going to talk about how to engage in relationship with one another in a healthy way. And we're also doing a community group push. We believe that life change happens on a community level, that when you look at your life, right, so often... When you make these different steps in your walk, very often it's because you're walking with someone who is encouraging you, who is challenging you, who is holding you accountable. That so, ma so much of our movement towards Jesus happens at a smaller community level. And so we challenge you guys to get into community groups. And, and on September 30th, we're going to ask you guys to be, all of you, we want all of you to be, to give us six weeks and be in a community group. And, and, and Michael here is one of our, come on around here, there you go. Michael is one of our community group leaders. And uh, I just wanted to, to ask him a couple questions on his experience. And he's actually my uh, community group leader. I, I go to his house on, on Saturday. So, um, so tell me, what, what do you like about our group? You know, what, 
Uh, so I, I'm trying to remember what I said at first service. So don't worry about it. Let the spirit anything. speak, man. Don't worry. But, uh, you know, it's one thing to, to get to know you guys here in a church setting in this building. Um, and I, I definitely appreciate the relationships that we've made. However, who are you all outside of this building? And for me, that's, that's one thing that I've yearned to, to, to do is to grow deeper in, in my relationships with others here in the church. Um, so it's, it's nice to have that setting where, where you can uh, do that. Also, um, man, you know, we're sitting here nice and proper and everything, but that's not life. And so in our home, we have, um, we have adults, we have kids running around in and out of the house, and it just is completely organic, and that's life. And so, again, who are we outside of this building? And so that's one thing that I've really enjoyed. Our dogs are crawling all over us and stuff while we're trying to talk, that kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, so what do you – personally, how has the group helped you, would you say? So I've learned – over the years to get outside of my comfort zone. Yeah. I, I'm getting outside of my comfort zone right now. He didn't want to do this when I asked him. I'm like, <laughs> come on, you can do this. You know? I was sweating earlier. Um, but getting outside of my comfort zone, just with the, the fact that I don't know if this scares anyone, um, how would you like to have 10 adults and 10 kids in your home? I don't know. Some of you guys may really just be jumping up and down about, about that thought. It kind of freaked me out. Um, and then also with the fact that, I mean, let's be honest, if we're going to grow in relationships, we need to be vulnerable. Uh, so that was another kind of step of getting outside of my comfort zone. So I've learned to really embrace that. And I think that, um, that just, this has really helped me in, in, in grow my faith and it's really challenged us. So, um, when we do our Bible study, we have kind of a homework assignment and guess what? We need to follow up the, the next time and hold each other accountable. So it's not just you just showing up. Um, you actually have to put something into it. Yeah, I've, I've been there where, like, like we have the homework. See, you can do this on Sundays. We're always giving you stuff to work on here, right? I mean, I'm always giving you guys homework. You can come in the next Sunday and just completely avoid people and get away with not touching it, right? You can, it's harder to do that in the community group, right? I've, I've had these moments where my head comes down, my tail's between my legs, and I'm like, I didn't do it. That's okay, right? So, um, so, so you're leading a group, right? What would you say um, to people who are thinking about joining a group? Please do. It, it's it's such a good opportunity. Um, you know, again, just taking all the all the great things that we do here in in church, um, but let's let's take another step. So, when we're listening to Jeff. We're, we're taking in that, in that information. We're processing it internally. When we're reading the Bible or something else, we're processing that internally. Um, when we're serving, we're living out our faith. Uh, in, in small group, we get to have that dialogue. So here's what I'm thinking. Here's, here's what I'm interpreting. How, how does that jive with, with your interpretation? What's your perspective on this? Um, and so it, it just adds that other component to building your faith. Um, also, I, I moved my family up here from North Carolina. We didn't know anyone up here. And so that was a huge leap of faith. And so as a result, we didn't know anyone. We didn't have that support system. I don't know where you all are. Maybe you've been in this community for years and you had that support system. Some of you may be totally new. Um, or maybe you've showed up at church, but you haven't, again, developed those connections. And that's really allowed me to lean on others. And I... I was thinking about this further. Not only am I leaning on others, but it's giving others an opportunity to serve. Um, so others, I, I, have, I have the yearning to serve. And so I don't know if I can help you if I don't have that relationship built. Um, so being able to have that, I, I think is pretty powerful. That's, very, yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, then uh, now s we've had about 19 people take uh, folders to be leaders. Um, so some of you are considering leading a group. Um, we do need you to, to commit or, or just let us know if you're not. That's okay, too. We, like we said, we're not, not pressuring anyone here. But some of you are also decided, like, yeah, I want to be in a group, or I'm already in a group, and we're going to do this, and we just need to re-up our commitment, you know, to our group or whatever. Uh, what would you say to, to them? 
So I guess really two things. One is it t takes a certain level of commitment um, to really just dedicate that time. You know, there, there may be other things going on in life, and, you know, you really need to, to dedicate that time. And not only is it for you, but it really helps benefit the group to have that variety of perspectives and to be able to lean on each other. So um, you get out of it what you put into it. So um, I would just note that. And then also don't have expectations on how the, the group is going or that, that group setting is going to go. I had the plan um, that we were going to have a Bible study every time we met, and it was going to, I had this perfect plan laid out, and oh my goodness, it has not gone to plan. So don't have expectations. Sometimes we get to a Bible study and it's great. Other times, there's just a few of us and we, we get to hang out. We get to connect on a deeper level and you know, sometimes you get more out of, out of just connecting than you would just through a, a Bible study. So be, be flexible and let God kind of guide you through that. Well, let's give Michael a hand. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, I, I can't reemphasize this enough that, uh, that, you know, community. Okay, so when you come here so often, we call this coming to church, right? Let's stop doing that, okay? You're coming to the place where the church gathers, right? But what that means, so in a way, you are coming to church because you're coming to the church. But what that means is when we tell you guys, when we ask you guys and encourage you guys to get into a community group, we're just telling you another way to go to church, to be with the church, to connect with the church. Some of you are very passionate and very consistent about showing up to church, but you miss something because your emphasis is not on the church. It's on Sunday morning. And so I want to challenge you to take that passion that you have for Sunday mornings and transfer it across all of this. And to recognize that when you meet on a smaller community group level, you have a chance of connecting. You have a chance of knowing one another. You can shed yourself. Uh, the, 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 the fronts that we put out so often at church that we pretend, we put on masks when we come. You can shed all that in the community group. Allow yourself to be vulnerable. And you will see yourself taking steps closer to Jesus. Now, here's, here's, I know that some of you are thinking, I've been in a small group before. I've been in a community group before. It didn't really work out that well. If I do this, it's just going to work out the same. Can I just say, I understand why you, why you think that, but that's stupid thinking. I went to Walmart, and I had a terrible experience, and that means all of these, rest, all these chains of, of uh, stores are all going to be terrible. So I refuse to go to Target. That's that kind of thinking. Because you had one set of people that you didn't connect with well, doesn't mean the next group is going to I've been there. When we were in Colorado, we tried to get connected to a small group, and it was weird. The people were weird. And so we, we, we went through the Bible study that we said we would do, and then we left. It was okay. But the next group that we went to, the people were still a little bit weird. But guess what? We learned to love them, Right? And they became incredibly close to us, people that we relied upon. And so if you've already been in a group and it didn't work, can I just say, we're going to do this every single year, okay? Every single year, at the beginning of the year, we're going to do a group push. Because we, we recognize how valuable, how important, how life-changing this can be for people. So we will continue to challenge and continue to push and continue to encourage that you get into a group. So if it doesn't work this time, this is why we're only telling you to go six weeks. This is a six-week commitment. That's all we're asking. So if you get into the group, you go and meet some people that you didn't know before. Maybe you recognize them from church, but you don't actually know them. If you go and they're weird, guess what? In six weeks, you don't have to go back anymore. And that's okay. Right? Now, and again, just for the record, you know what half the problem is? is that half the problem is that I'm weird and I don't fit into the right kind of weird, right? Just for the record. So if someone leaves, the reason I'm saying that is someone leaves your group, they're going to be like, man, they're thinking I'm weird. There's a chance that maybe they're weird, just for the record. So just throwing that out there, okay? So Nicole is going to be in the back here. 
helping people sign up. Um, but we just want you to know, you can sign up for a group right now by going to our website. There's a groups tab. You click on that, and you can look for a group that way. You can find a group. If you don't like getting on your computer, which I know I'm talking to some of those people right now, that's why Nicole is in the back. We're going to be doing this for three weeks. But I'm here to tell you, don't. If you feel like God is saying, yes, I need this for myself, I need to get further connected, I want to get closer to God, and it's been stale, and this is going to be one of those things that can help me, if that's you, don't hesitate. Don't wait. Do it now. Get on the group finder on your phone. You can just do it on your phone. Or do it when you get home, or go back and do it now. Nicole is ready to connect people. We have group leaders. We have some new group leaders who are ready to receive people. Like, we're ready to take you. Can you give that commitment for six weeks? Come on. It's six weeks, right? It's six weeks. You can do that. And then if you don't like it, you don't have to keep doing it. But here's what's going to happen. Some of you are going to do this. Hopefully all of you, but some of you are going to do this. And you might find some people that five years from now, you can't imagine living life without them. That could happen for you. So give it a shot, okay? Let me pray you out. Let me pray you out. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we thank you for the cross, and we thank you that, that you gave us relationships, and we thank you that we have a chance to get closer to you, Father. In your name, Jesus, I pray that we would all be thinking steps, steps closer. I pray that we would all be thinking about what our next step is. God, I pray that we would care about what matters most in this life, that we would shed the temporary things and the temporary trappings and the temporary pleasures of this world, and we would recognize the eternal, the life-changing things that really matter, and that we would continue to emphasize those things in our life. Jesus, we love you, and we thank you that you made us so important in your life. It's in your name we pray. Amen.